This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. As I promised last weekend, we have the next installment today of the vision of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich's Life of Jesus Christ. Here you will hear two principal stories, two visions of hers. They're both very short. The first is the really an insight into the how just well to use borrow a term from Francis how absolutely unbelievably rigid the Pharisees were how blinded they were by their own man-made laws about you know the nature of Our Lady and the nature of Our Lord she provides some interesting insight here that is not to be missed and the second vision is that of Zachary going to the temple and being in his encounter with the angel and losing his ability to speak unless he, of course, followed the will of our Lord. I'll leave you with that. Let me know what you thought of this at the end. A glance at the obduracy of the Pharisees, a vision of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. How obdurate and obstinate the priests and the Pharisees of the temple were may be discovered from the small esteem in which they held the distinctions bestowed upon the Holy Family. First, Joachim's offering was rejected, but after some months both his own and his wife's were, by God's command, received. Joachim was admitted even into the presence of the Holy of Holies, and he, as well as Anne, was, though unknown to each other, led into the passage under the temple. There they met. Mary was conceived, and priests awaited them at the entrance of this cave under the temple. All that took place by God's command. I have seen that sometimes, though not often, the sterile were commanded to be let in there. Mary entered the temple in her fourth year, and in all things she was distinguished and remarkable. The sister of Lazarus's mother was her teacher and nurse. Her whole manner of acting was so remarkable, so marvelous, that I have seen great roles written by aged priests about her. I think they still lie hidden with other writings. Then came the wonderful manifestations at Joseph's espousals and the blossoming of his rod, the accountants of the three kings and of the shepherds, the presentation of Jesus, Anna's and Simeon's testimony, and the teaching of Jesus at the age of twelve in the temple. But all this the priests and Pharisees noticed not. Their mind was preoccupied by business and court affairs. Because the Holy Family lived in voluntary retirement and poverty, they were forgotten in the crowd. The more enlightened, however, such as Simeon, Anna, and others knew of them. But when Jesus appeared and John bore witness to him, the teachings of the Pharisees were so directly contradictory that, even if the signs of his coming had not been forgotten by them, they would certainly not have been made known by them. Herod's reign and the Roman yoke had so involved them in quarrels and intrigues that their taste for spiritual things was weakened. They did not esteem John's testimony, and they soon forgot him after he was beheaded. They cared little for the teaching and miracles of Jesus, and their ideas of the prophets and the Messiah were altogether erroneous. It is not surprising, therefore, that they so shamefully treated Jesus and put him to death, that they disavowed his resurrection, the wonderful signs that followed it, and even the fulfillment of his prophecy respecting the destruction of Jerusalem. Nor is it to be wondered at that they neglected the signs that heralded his advent, since he had not at that time either taught or wrought miracles. Were the blindness, the obduracy of these men not so incomprehensibly great? Could it not have lasted even to this day? When I go over the way of the cross in Jerusalem of the present day, I frequently see under a certain ruined building a large vault, or many adjoining vaults, which are part partly fallen in and filled with water. Standing in the midst of the water, which rises almost to a level with it, is a table. From the center of the table to the foot of the vault rises a pillar, around which are hung little coffers filled with rolls of writings. Under the table also I saw rolls lying in the water. Perhaps these vaults were once burial places. They lie under Mount Calvary. I think the ruined building is the house where Pilate once dwelt, and the treasure will after some time be discovered. John promised to Zachary, a vision of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. I saw Zachary conversing with Elizabeth. He was telling her how sad he was because his turn to offer sacrifice in the temple was drawing near, and how he dreaded the contempt that would there await him on account of his being childless. Zachary went twice a year to the temple. He did not live at Hebron himself, but at a place called Huta, about 15 minutes' walk from Hebron. 
The ruins of former buildings still lay between the two places, leading one to fancy that they had once been connected. Many such ruins were to be found on the other side of Hebron, for the place was once as large as Jerusalem. At Hebron dwelt priests of a lower degree, and Huta those at a higher rank. Zachary seemed to be the superior of them all. He and Elizabeth were regarded with extraordinary veneration from the fact of both having descended in a direct line from the race of Aaron. I saw Zachary with many people of this locality, going to a little property that he owned in the neighborhood of Huta. It consisted of a house, an orchard, and a spring. I saw him there also with the Holy Family at the time of Mary's visitation. At the period of which I am speaking, Zachary was teaching the people and praying with them. It seemed to be a preparation for a feast. He told them of his great dejection and of his pre presentiment that something remarkable was going to happen to him. Again, I saw Zachary with the same people going to Jerusalem, where he had to wait four days before his turn to sacrifice came around. Until that time, he prayed in the fore part of the temple. At last, when his turn came, he went into the sanctuary outside the entrance to the Holy of Holies. The roof over the altar of incense was open so that the sky could be seen. The priest offering sacrifice was not visible to those outside. A partition concealed him, but the smoke of the incense could be seen rising. I think Zachary told the other priests that he must be left alone, for I saw them leaving the sanctuary. Zachary went into the Holy of Holies where it was dark. It appeared to me that he took the tables of the laws out of the Ark of the Covenant and laid them upon the golden altar of incense. When he kindled the incense, I saw to the right of the altar a light coming down on him, and in it a luminous figure. Zachary, frightened, stepped back, and sank as if in ecstasy at the right side of the altar. The angel raised him up and spoke some words to him. Zachary replied, Then I saw something like a ladder led down from heaven, and two angels ascending and descending to him. One took something from him, but the other, after Zachary had opened his garment, inserted a shining little body in his side. Zachary had become dumb. I saw him before leaving the Holy of Holies, writing out a little tablet that lay there. This tablet he sent at once to Elizabeth, who likewise had had a vision at that same hour. I saw that the people outside were troubled and anxious on account of Zachary's remaining so long in the sanctuary. They were even moving toward the door to open it when Zachary replaced the tables in the ark and came forth. The crowd questioned him about his long stay in the sanctuary. He tried to answer, but he could not. He signified to them by signs that he had become dumb and went away. Zachary was a tall and an exceedingly majestic old man. In case you've ever wondered what the, you know, or marveled at the story of Zachary and the conception of John and the naming of John the Baptist, now maybe have some better insight. A very vivid description, really, of what, <laughs> what Zachary went through and how, you know, we know how the story plays out, of course. When it came time for John the Baptist name day, he, he could not speak until he, you know, named the child John, as what he was commanded by the angel. Despite the fact that no one in his name had a name similar to that, he was thus named John, as commanded by the angel who was passing on the command of God to his servant Zachary. Sometimes God needs to paint us a, a sign, we, you know, paint us an image we can't miss, give us a bright neon sign that we must do something. This was Zachary's bright neon sign curious what you thought of this so let me know in the comments please like and subscribe if you haven't it does help as does sharing this on social media that helps too as always pray for the church i'm anthony stein ave maria